So first I'll kind of start with who I am. So I was a Yale studio lead. I was actually part of the Yale DFA studio all four years um, that I was there for my degree. Um, I got a mechanical engineering degree, um, kind of a concentration in architecture. We didn't have minors, but I took a lot of architecture classes, which kind of you know, gave me what I was looking for in terms of learning more about design and kind of how designing spaces can really affect the way people use them. Um, right now I work at Harley Davidson as a finite element analyst, um, so a very like physics heavy mechanical engineering kind of job, um, but have started this company called Rosy River Boots um, to kind of fulfill that need and that itch to uh, serve people, but also to follow through the human-centered design process. So the goal of Rosy River Boots is to provide in design um, professional and stylish female steel toe boots. Um, so the idea is that, you know, people like myself um, who like to present more femininely um, find themselves kind of feeling out of place in the workforce when you're wearing these kind of clunky, more men-styled men steel-toed boots. And so creating a company that allows for more female-specific workwear um, and specifically with a professional touch, with this idea that you're not just on the factory floor all day, but you're also talking to the CEO or bosses or potentially clients and that it's really important to be able to put your um, best foot forward. Uh, so the, the goals of today's talk, um, first we're going to kind of talk about finding community partners. It can be kind of hard to know where to start, um, especially if you had bad experiences in the past and are looking for new community partners, um, how to manage expectations and to make sure you are both on the same page, and then scoping off center, how to make sure that you've picked a project that is both the appropriate size, but also kind of you know, within the scope and purpose of DFA, which is, you know, making your community a better place. Um, and then scoping project size and making sure that it is something attainable for you guys as students. That was something that I remember, you know, was really difficult is that it's really fun and it's really exciting to come up with these like huge grand ideas. And then it was really hard to be able to deliver them. And so how to make sure that you're scoping within your capabilities, but also within your timeline. Um, so I'll start by talking about finding community partners. So the number one thing I realized very early, both while trying to recruit other students, but also recruit community partners, is DFA can be kind of hard to explain. Um, you can't describe it really in three words. I mean, you could say it's design for America, or you could say, oh, it's human-centered design. But if people don't know what those phrases mean, it can end up being this long paragraph type conversation about like, what human-centered design is, and then some people have heard of it as service design or user design, and then design thinking can mean you know, a number of different things. And so I have found it really helpful to have an elevator speech handy and to really kind of narrow down the sentence that I said when I was describing what Design for America was. Um, and then also to have a really good example handy. So I'll talk about the example that I usually use later on in um, the presentation, but have an example of what you think a good project was and kind of walk them through why you thought it was a good project. Um, I always really focused on the words user research, and you know you can say this in a number of different ways if you can tell that the person doesn't get what you're talking about, but that the big goal is being able to talk to the person um, who is the user, but also the rest of the stakeholders, and having that face-to-face -face communication um, was like the goal of finding a good community partner. Um, for kind of finding them in your network, I cold called and sent a ton of emails almost every year. So we had year-long projects, um, but the same kind of would go for a semester-long project. I would start the summer before, and I would just send maybe 20 different emails, um, kind of like a standard template of what DFA was, who I was, and what we were looking for, and really hoped that they kind of got back to me. Um, what I did notice, kind of like taking good pictures, you know, if I sent 20, maybe five good projects would come back out of that. Um, also found it really helpful to get suggestions from previous community partners. So even if you know it wasn't the greatest, you know, partnership in terms of like you wish it had gone a little bit differently, but you didn't end on bad terms. I found that oftentimes they had suggestions of other groups that you know would be a really good match, or there'd be people. So we did a couple of different projects that involved um, the different shelters in the New Haven area, and they all knew each other, and they all worked with each other, and went to the same conferences. So oftentimes they'd say, oh, yes, you should go reach out to this other shelter. There's a veterans group over here that does this thing. Um, and oftentimes, even though they gave, they were totally separate partnerships, um, it was because of that reference that 
you know, we got that connection. Uh, but also tap your networks. At the beginning of every sem every year, I would send an email to, we were hosted through our engineering school. Um, so I'd send an email to the head of our engineering school and say, hey, like, has anyone asked you to do a student project? And is it something you think would fit for BFA? And oftentimes, they, he'd come back and say, like, oh, yeah, we have this one person who's really interested in, you know, getting someone to build something for the athletics teams. And so maybe it wasn't a great fit, but it was kind of a starting point, and it got that conversation started that led into what a good design project might be. Um, so communicating what DFA was to partners, like I said, it was really useful to have a draft email and just kind of a standard thing that worked really well. Have someone who has no idea what DFA is read it um, and give you some feedback on it before you start sending it to potential community partners. Um, you know, that kind of sense of you should be able to walk away having a really good sense of what this club does. Um, we also found it really useful. We started doing this only a couple years ago, and I know a lot of groups have websites, but to have very specific highlighted projects on the website so that on that front page when they're going, they can say, like, what does this group do? And they can click on one of three. And so we picked three very different examples. So we had an Illuminaloon, which was this kind of really open-ended, fun design project of how can we make it safer for communicating people who've been stuck um, in their houses or under rubble in like hurricane situations or disasters and communicate to the Red Cross or other services that they're there. And so it was this lamp that would rise into the air and light up, right, to something slightly more specific, which was we were approached by um, one of the churches in the New Haven area who said we have this clothing closet and we just think it could work a lot more efficiently. What can you do for us? Um, to like reducing dining hall waste within our cafeteria system. Um, and so, the, you know, kind of giving an example of big, broad projects to very specific ones to kind of a student on campus one. Um, and that, that really helps because you could send a specific link and say, click on this link, it'll give you an example of the type of thing we've done either with a shelter or, you know, community group or potentially student group before. Um, I always emphasize that we aren't a consultancy. I think sometimes we kind of act like a design consultancy, but when people, when community partners hear the word consultant, they're thinking that we're going to come and we're going to make whatever project that they already have in mind. And I think somebody kind of mentioned that when they're talking about a good partnership is that they need to be open minded to the idea that, you know, if in their mind the perfect solution would be, you know, a set of bookshelves, that we might not end up at that point. Um, and so that was something that you want to be pretty explicit about, is that you don't have a design idea in mind and that you'll probably change a couple times. Um, and so it's not about kind of fulfilling their requests, but more about walking through a process with them. Um, and there's a lot of things that they'll get out of the process too, and I talk about that a little bit later, about how to kind of explain what they can expect out of it as well. Um, I also heard a couple of times people had mentioned making sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, so something that we started doing last year um, before I graduated was handing the community partners a calendar and walking them through the whole design process. And so for us, because it was year-long projects, we'd say up until you know winter break, we are only going to be doing research. And then after winter break, we're going to be prototyping and we'd have smaller deadlines along the way. I also found that it was really useful for our teams to have internal deadlines because it can be both really fun, but also kind of you know cyclic to get really caught up in the research and you can always ask more people questions and you can always find other stakeholders or new ideas. And so it was useful to know that, oh, we have this deadline, our community partner expects this, and we have to you know make a decision at that point. And I think one of the beauties of kind of the design thinking process is it's cyclic, you know, and so it's very iterative. And just because you made an, a decision doesn't mean it's the end decision. You can go back, you can change your mind, but you're kind of trying that process, right? You're prototyping that idea. Um, and that having a firm calendar that you both were on the same page for uh, really helped with that. Um, so something that we started doing kind of a couple years in was finding the community partners first and then figuring out a project from that. So I know oftentimes when we talk about the design thinking process, we always start with this very broad kind of like uh, almost like wicked problem, you know, this kind of generally, uh, you know, homelessness or reducing waste or how can we 
you know, get more girls into STEM and engineering, you know, or diversify. Um, but that it was really hard to narrow that quickly and kind of effectively. And so we almost found it much more helpful to find community partners first and kind of build a project out of them. And so this was definitely something that we kind of did more in the leadership team. So we'd have all of us would sit down um, and we'd come up with a list of potential community partners and then try to figure out if a good project could be matched to them. Um, and then the, when we proposed it to our larger group as a whole, talked about it as kind of like the larger project, you know, so that they were walking through the full, you know, scope of having this big problem and then narrowing it down. But the reason we did this and the reason we found it really successful is that it meant that you always had stakeholders to talk to. So you had, you know, whoever your contact was as a community partner, you usually had users, you had your contact's boss or mentor or the leadership board or their on-call psychologist, or you had more than one person that you could interview, which was really important. And I think having that face-to-face -face connection not only really helps you walk through the human-centered design process, but also really gets your team members to commit to the project that they're working on. They see a real person and that they're kind of working with this real person um, instead of just this abstract idea. Um, and you also get to talk to a lot of professionals. And so oftentimes, you know, there's people connected to or on the boards for um, these community partners. And again, that's another face-to-face -face communication that you have. Um, so an example was we found St. Paul and St. James um, Church and they came to us and they said, hey, we would love someone to do something with our clothing closet process. Um, and they didn't really know what they wanted. They just knew it wasn't working. And they were connected to us through one of our other previous um, community partners. And we used that as a bridge to build a project out. And so this kind of leads into this idea that I want to talk about that I've kind of been calling scoping off center. Um, so the way... I would propose DFA to a lot of these community partners. We would say, what is something you have always loved to do but don't have the bandwidth for right now? You don't have the money, you don't have the manpower, you don't have the time. You know, what is it that people complain about but like isn't your priority? So for example, we worked with this veteran center and they, you know, constantly got complaints that the bus stop outside didn't have a cover. And so people were constantly out in the snow and in the rain waiting for the bus. But that wasn't their priority. It was, you know, owned by the city government. Like they did not have that. That wasn't what they wanted to work on or could work on. But it was something they heard about all the time. Um, and then another one, which kind of goes back to the clothing closet. Like, how can we troubleshoot a system that already exists? So, what's a system you have, um, a service you provide that you really think could be a little bit smoother, or cleaner? Um, so the goal is not to disrupt their day-to-day -day services. Because, you know, they have a lot going on. They have a million things there. A lot of times these are, you know, nonprofits and they're providing something. Um, so an example I have here is the Beth L Center. So we approached a family shelter and we said, hey, we'd really love to do a project with you guys. Um, what are things that you're interested in and curious about? Um, and they said, okay, well, you know, there's lack of shelter, which is kind of what the building provides. There's lack of food. So we have a kitchen and kind of ways for people to buy food, um, lack of child care. There's instability in kind of the family situations. Um, people need help finding jobs. And then we said, OK, but like what's something you've always wanted to work on but don't have time for? And they said, oh, well, we just went to this conference and they were talking about how homelessness can be really traumatic for children and that they are experiencing it constantly because of the instability of it and not knowing who's in charge and that it's really hard not to have any rules or consistency. But, you know, like the children aren't our priority other than making sure that they're safe. Um, they're, you know, their parents are in charge of making the rules, making sure that they, you know, get help on their homework. And we just don't have time to really focus on the kids if you guys could do something for that. And so then we've acted that out into kind of a bigger project. So we said homelessness, homelessness in New Haven, you know, and then narrowing even more homelessness at the Bethel Center. Um, and then kind of very specifically, how can we reduce trauma in the children at the Bethel Center? And so this evolved into a final project that was actually a coloring book that explained all the rules of the center. So it kind of tackled two different problems that we observed after doing some user research. The first was that, you know, when families first showed up at the shelter, it could be any time of night, 
Um, and it took, you know, about an hour to fill out all the paperwork. And so the children were expected to sit there and be quiet or maybe, you know, like, you know, from kind of the dentist's office, play with those little puzzle type games. But oftentimes they weren't the right age for those. Um, and then secondly, there was a lot of terminology that the shelter staff used that they realized the kids weren't picking up on. And so wanted to be able to explain some of those rules and terminologies to them pretty quickly and early on. And so we developed this coloring book that walked through the different rooms in the shelter, um, kind of gave the description of how the laundry service worked, you know, how and to ask for computer access, um, and also gave them an activity they could do on that first day. The other example I was talking about was, again, kind of with homelessness and homelessness narrowed into homelessness in New Haven. And then, you know, there was this shelter or there was this clothing closet at St. Paul's um, Church. But it was really disorganized and people weren't really walking away feeling like they found what they needed. There was actually a ridiculous amount of donations, which, you know, sounds really great, but they had almost five bedroom sized rooms filled to the roof with just plastic garbage bags of clothes they didn't even have time to sort through. So they needed a really efficient clothing system and also a way to make sure that people were finding the clothing they needed and that was seasonally appropriate. And so in Connecticut it snowed and so it was important to be able to find the jackets really quickly in the back room and make sure that they were out front and findable. Otherwise the service they were providing wasn't really solving anything. Um, and so we redesigned their entire space for them. Um, we actually got a grant that helped with us paint the walls and tear down, you, you tear up the floor and the carpet, um, and polish it, but also to create this organizational system in the back room that helped make sure that everything was in the right place and generically in the right size and season. Um, and so in both of these cases, you know, we found a community partner first, um, and then we figured out what a good project would be with us working with them something that wasn't, you know, interacting too directly with their day-to-day, -day, so they weren't going to be incredibly disappointed, you know, if we couldn't provide this answer for them, um, but would definitely benefit them if we could find this final good solution with a good prototype for them. Um, and so good parameters for project size. Something that I suggested to our, other, to our um, team leads was that you want to be able to imagine three potential solutions. Um, so when the Bethel Center was talking to us, for instance, they were like, well, we could do trauma in children, we could do, you know, teaching people how to cook or how to buy more healthy groceries, or they had a number of different options, but we found that the, having trauma in children or helping reduce that was something that we could imagine kind of a mechanical solution for, it could be some sort of toy or some sort of, you know, box that they got to have that was their own personal space. We could come up with all sorts of systems that would be great for that, as well as kind of you know, there's almost always like an app version of something, you know, so a technology based something. So for the kids, it was going to be some sort of computer game. Um, and the fact that we could come up with those three ideas on the spot meant that we probably could come up with 50 different directions once we actually started getting really involved in the process. And so I found that having these three kind of markings doesn't really limit you. It kind of sounds like you would, you know, you're not supposed to start thinking about the solutions before you actually, you know, start getting through the process and then talk to the users. But when scoping the project, it was a good metric for knowing that there were good solutions at the end. Um, and also that your project was at the right size. And so, for example, if we had just said homelessness in New Haven, if somebody said, what would be a good mechanical system or a system solution for that, you know, you don't quite know where to go with that because it's so broad. You know, you need to start narrowing from there. And so it was a good marker not only for kind of the scope and the size, but also that you would have good solutions at the end and could go through that process really successfully. Um, the next marker is that you had one to two professionals not related to your community partners, so not working there, that you could reach out to. Um, so the goal wasn't to make sure that those two people talked to you necessarily, but just that so for the Bethel Center, um, Yale had a psychology division that focused specifically on trauma in children. Um, and there was two different departments that we could reach out to. There's one at Yale and there's one at a local college at Quinnipiac. And we reached out to both of them and both of them sat down and gave us these really awesome talks about how trauma shows up in children and different ways people have tried to reduce it um, and what are some of the ways that have been really successful. And so having those professionals that weren't part of the community partners also brought new information to the table. Um, 
And then the big thing is making sure you can accomplish it in your timeline. So again, you don't want to narrow your group's brainstorming. You don't want to say, oh, this has to be something that we can make in the next two weeks. But knowing that you could accomplish something within your timeline is really important. So we always encourage people to brainstorm out of the scope and then would use kind of a matrix or chart to say, you know, what's the most important parts for the community partner um, what are things they have to have and also kind of like what's the most feasible so what is something that we can get done and our timelines allowed and this kind of brings me into the point of why it's okay not to have a perfect solution so i think something that i used to get really caught up in was this idea that like okay if we're going to build an app you know or we're going to build a game or a playground for the kids at the Bethel Center. We have to build the full thing. It has to be perfect because we're gonna walk away at the end of the year and it needs to work for them, you know? Um, but it's really okay to kind of scope down from that and to focus on getting through the whole design thinking process instead of making a perfect end product. Um, partly because, you know, we're all still students, you know, we were still learning our skill sets. We didn't have, you know, master's degree in child psychology and we didn't have, you know, professional carpentry skills and much less like know if we were going to do a playground like how to build one safely you know um, and also don't have the resources or longevity necessary to roll out those high level solutions like in the workforce it can take five to ten years to make one of these products happen you know or at least at the kind of fidelity we are imagining in our minds and could kind of recognize that this is an iteration within a larger process so what you're doing with your kind of even maybe half-baked solution is you're providing an iteration to your community partner. So they don't have to try that again if it doesn't work. If it does work, they know it's successful and they can move on to a second iteration of it or they can hire someone to do it. I always try to think of it as, you know, getting it to a point that you could pass it off to a startup team, but it's not the final solution, you know? So if somebody, you know, four years from now, who worked on this project with you really wanted to start a business and they felt really passionate about the users that you worked with, they could pick it up right where you left off and say, we have basic user data, we have a couple prototypes, and we have a couple of designs, and we can go from there. Um, but the whole point of rapid prototyping is the fact that your first solution is not going to be perfect. And so especially given kind of the constraints you're at, it's important to remember that this is part of a larger process, especially for the community partner. So even if you leave at the end of the year, you know, they've learned a lot from it. And so that's something else I want to really focus in on is that even if you don't have a perfect solution, the community partners gain a lot. So on one hand, something they always came back and mentioned to us was that they loved getting all the user data and they got a ton of it. Right. And so even if you only interviewed, you know, five users, you had give it, asked all sorts of questions that they probably had never thought to ask, much less the fact that you're a new person, you know, a fresh face. And so instead of a parent talking to the same counselor that they've been talking to for the last month, you know, about their kid, they're not talking to this new person um, who doesn't have the same background and they can give a little bit more honest opinions. So the community partners really appreciated the data. They really loved the list of ideas we came up with. And it's hard to kind of realize that, you know, a good brainstorming session can be really valuable, but oftentimes they're so busy, especially when it comes to community organizations just getting the day-to-day -day work done that they don't have time to sit down and have fun kind of ideation sessions. Um, and so they really love just the new ideas that we brought to it, as well as we often ended up connecting them to other professionals or different community groups, either really informally. So at the end of our, um, we'd give final presentations at the end of the year and they'd meet each other and we've had groups go off and say, oh, we're gonna do this project together. Um, or even just introducing them to the new professionals. So with the Bethel Center, we introduced them to the um, child psychologists, and they ended up having a great conversation about different ways to continue the project forward um, by themselves. But you've also tested an idea for them. So even if it's a really low fidelity prototype, you've created something that's real, and now they have something to start with and go on. Um, and then our students. So something that I was always really upfront about when talking to community partners is that we kind of, you know, as a studio leader, a leadership team, we had two goals and two clients. And one was the community partner and making sure that they got something out of it. 
um, but also that was our students. And I thought of DFA as kind of a place where, you know, students are going to get to learn and walk through the human-centered design process. And so it was really important to both be able to walk through the whole process, but also to teach empathy. And so being able to talk to users was really important, but also to get out of that bubble that usually exists on college campuses, you know, where all you talk to are people your own age, um, you all, you know, are in kind of ish the same place in life. And so being able to break out of that bubble was really valuable for us as well. Um, be part of a committed team. If we got to talk to real people and got to build that empathy and also work on those projects, you know, the team ended up being a lot more close knit. Um, one of the biggest things I'd say as like a suggestion, if you're having trouble keeping people committed, is put them in front of users as soon as possible because I saw that just be a huge game changer and um, how seriously people took their project. Um, but also, it's kind of a portfolio piece, you know, we're people who want to go into design potentially professionally. Um, and like, at Yale, we didn't have a design major. And so it was kind of nice and cool to be able to say, oh, we did this thing with this community partner, and let me talk to you all about it and what we learned from it. Um, and so that was also something we as students gained. So the fact that both the community partner and the students got something out of it um, was really important for us when we were scoping projects. Um, Finally, just kind of some other random notes. Um, it can be really difficult to find community partners. Some relationships don't work out and or they're not what you expected. And that's the way it goes, you know. Um, something I did find was that if you start by trying to identify that community partner first, and even if they end up kind of falling through, you usually had a couple good conversations with them or at least exchanged some emails, got some background. Um, and it kind of gives you credibility to move forward and reach out to someone else. Um, so for example, we had a group working on an autoimmune disease and was working with a very specific clinic um, at the New Haven Hospital. But the New Haven Hospital was kind of wishy-washy. They wanted to let them talk to patients, but didn't really want them to and weren't really sure. Um, but because we had this kind of connection to the hospital, um, the group reached out to a couple of Facebook groups very specifically for this, dis, um, for this disease and said, hey, we're doing this project. We'd love it if everyone could fill out the survey. And they got, you know, over 300 responses for it. And so even though it wasn't a face-to-face -face communication with the user, it was a really having that connection and being able to say, oh, we're doing this project with this, you know, real clinic um, kind of gave them the credibility they needed to reach out to these other groups. Um, it's also, I found, really hard to make a lasting impact without a partnership. Um, I think it's hard when you don't have something to kind of help you narrow. You're tackling a problem that's so big and has so many potential possible solutions, um, and it feels like you're not really getting anywhere sometimes. And so I, that's another reason I found it really useful to start with a community partner and then kind of build a project out of that. Um, it was also really hard whenever you worked with students. Um, because students are really easy to access users, but it's really hard to kind of narrow down on anything. And so we found it really useful to work with another club. So for instance, one of the projects we did was with our LGBTQ plus center. And it was important that we had, you know, they wanted to work on um, a very specific project revolving around clothes and gender identity and you know, the fact that we could help with them with that was great, but more importantly, they could take that project and move forward with it um, versus just having kind of like this loose idea that might be could happen. I also found that at least on our campus, clubs tended to have better draw when it came to if they wanted to host an event. Um, they had the networks to have people come to the event instead of, you know, your five person team potentially working on a project. Um, also start scoping really early. Like I said, it's kind of hit or miss sometimes. And so start reaching out to community partners as soon as possible. Um, also, they're really slow to respond. And so we often kind of baked that into our schedule, realizing that you know, it would take them two weeks to get back to us about something. One of the ways we kind of handled that is we, again, with the calendar, made very specific deadlines and got on their calendar really early. So even if we hadn't completed anything, we'd still show up at, the, at their office and talk to them, you know, and just have that face communication. Um, and sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes it's not a good fit for your club. So once in a while, somebody would come up and it would be in the middle of the school year and we didn't, couldn't help them or it wouldn't really be a design thinking project or wouldn't really be a good fit. 
Um, so ways we came up with to kind of make sure we kept that, you know, positive communication going um, and that nobody had kind of hurt feelings from it. We would include them in sprints. So we ended up doing a design sprint at the beginning of every year to kind of quickly walk through the design thinking process. Um, and we'd use one of those projects for it. So something that wasn't a great kind of long term project or that maybe our group wasn't super excited to tackle. Um, we'd use them in that kind of week long sprint. Um, we'd also invite a lot of groups back for our brainstorming workshop. So when we taught brainstorming and kind of, you know, some of the good positive ways to, you know, not negate ideas, et cetera, um, we would use an example from one of these groups. And so sometimes, for instance, like uh, startups would come to us and startups aren't quite, you know, the community partners we were looking for, but they were really great fodder for brainstorming workshops. Um, or just asking them to come back next year, really politely describing like, you know, right now we have a full docket or we don't have the people for it and we'd really love for you guys to either come back or, you know, let us know if you have other projects that come to mind. Um, this is just kind of an email example, but I'll leave that. Um, so if you have any questions or would like to connect, um, this is my email. This is my LinkedIn. Um, I didn't do the thing that you're supposed to do where you create like a really fancy polished LinkedIn link. So it has weird jumble at the end and I apologize for that. And if you're more curious about Rosie River Boots, um, this is a website for that if you wanted to learn more about that as well. Um, thank you.